Welcome to Question Time. On tonight's panel, a former minister in David Cameron's government and leader of last night's rebellion in Parliament against continuing Covid restrictions, Mark Harper. Labour's shadow policing minister who backed Keir Starmer in the leadership contest, Sarah Jones. Leader of the Scottish National Party's group of MPs at Westminster, Ian Blackford. Writer, former political advisor, a columnist for the Times newspaper and conservative peer in the House of Lords, Daniel Finkelstein. And someone who's worked in the theatre for 40 years, she founded the Ambassador Theatre Group, which is one of the world's biggest theatre companies, Rosemary Squire. Good evening. Welcome to my guests here in the studio. Rosemary, welcome to you. Joining us down the line from Cornwall. And, of course, welcome to our QT50 audience. Very good to see some of you. Familiar faces by now. And, of course, welcome to you at home as well. Thank you very much for watching the programme. And do join in the conversation the usual way on social media at BBC Question Time. Right. Our first question tonight is from PS. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, panel. Um, should care workers be forced to have COVID vaccinations in order to do their jobs? And should NHS workers be the next group to be forced? Now, Piers, I'm going to ask you, because you are a surgeon in the NHS, you've had your vaccine. I think you've told us that before. Uh, that, and what do you think of the idea of making it compulsory? I'm quite against it, to be honest. I think, you know, it should be, it should be a different strategy. I think people should be encouraged to have vaccinations. I think, like many uh, people from the BAME community, I have an intrinsic vaccine hesitancy, which I had to overcome in order to have the vaccine, uh, to be fair. I had to be convinced about it. I had to think about it quite a lot. Uh, and that's as someone who uh, is in that, is in the NHS. I think if you look at, you know, over 20% of NHS workers come from BAME communities. You know, there are half a million carers from BAME communities. I think if you try and mandate these things, you will change people that are vaccine hesitant to being anti-vaxxers and actually you'll end up, you know, making them less likely to want to be vaccinated. You'd also make them more likely to, to quit and do other things. So you'll actually, I think, um, make the problem worse. Um, I never really thought the answer to trying to convince someone to do something is by forcing them to do it. I think, you know, it's much better to give them a carrot than to beat them over the head with a stick. OK. Uh, so I think, you know, I think it should be a different approach, really. Mark. Well, this is a it's, a... it's a difficult question, this, and I, I, I think I half agree with what, what Piers has said. And it's, of course, we're not forcing people to have a vaccine. We're saying that in order to be a frontline care worker, you would have to be vaccinated, which is not quite the same thing, but it does raise... Well, it means the... you get the vaccine well, or you lose it, your job. Well, it does raise the issue, though, about people then being driven out of care. And, of course, it's a sector where we do have some workforce challenges. My own view is I think I would prefer to start with understanding the issues about why people are hesitant to take a vaccine, particularly people in the care sector. You know, they all want to look after the people and care for the people that, that are in the care home or whatever. So there are, but we've, be been vac we've been vaccinating care workers for six months now. Surely the government must understand well, those reasons. A, well, th there are clearly issues in some, in, for some people. It's, we, we've vaccinated a very high percentage, but there are still people who are hesitant. And my judgment is you want the strategy that's going to be most successful. But I do also understand why ministers are worried that you, you would have people in those settings. But also, I think you can look at other strategies around testing, um, the other thing I raised in Parliament yesterday was the issue about people in domiciliary care, because at the moment we've talked about people in, in a care home, but of course there are millions of people across the country that have someone coming into their own home and going to other people's homes, and the government's going to consult on that, and that okay. raises a whole load of other complicated questions. So I think this is very mixed, and I've got, I'm in two minds about what the right answer is, actually. Rosemary. Um... I have a daughter, a young adult with, who has Down syndrome and is deemed to be extremely clinically vulnerable and she lives in a supported living house. So I feel quite strongly, I, I, I know it's very difficult to compel anyone to do anything, but I do feel my daughter in the situation she lives in, as part of their job, the people who support her to live should be vaccinated. Um, I think it's it's part of the job and, and it needs to happen now, I'm afraid. And, Daniel, I guess it comes down I to guess... who's right to take priority. Is it the person, like Rosemary's daughter, who who isn't choosing to be looked after people but needs to be looked after people, or the people who, who take the job? 
Well, it has to be the people who are being looked after. That actually is the, in fact, you put your finger on the reason why I favour this policy, why I reluctantly, I think Mark captured very well that it's very difficult, but I reluctantly do support this policy. I don't think it is in the end unreasonable to expect care workers to uh, accede to some medical requirements. Even um, if it makes... I mean, given that well, there's a shortage of care workers at the moment, even okay. if it increases the number who, who quit? So I have two problems. There's obviously the, the question of having enough people who do it. And the second thing the government's got to ensure is that those people have alternative work. I mean, there's, there's talk about giving them alternative jobs, but they've got to actually understand... It was very interesting, the point you made about uh, ethnic minorities having... Uh, in some ethnic minorities having reluctance and those people very predominant in the care working sector. The government's got to be very sensitive and understanding about that. But ultimately, in a, when you're choosing between whether it's the member of staff or the people who are being cared for that take priority, I think it does have to be focused around the people who are being cared for. So I think you do have to make a priority choice, and that, that would be mine, but it's very difficult. Sean, you've got your hand up. Uh, hi, good, hi, good evening. Yeah, I just find it absolutely appalling, you know, that we're saying to these NHS workers, you know, who have been taught to applaud and that are wonderful and that have risked their lives. Um, I've got a family member who's an NHS worker. Now, she's not refusing the vaccine. She's gone to have the vaccine on three separate occasions and has been turned away because she has a history of anaphylaxis. Where does that leave her? Are we going to say, yes, you're wonderful, you've risked your life, but now on your bike, basically, because you're not willing to, you know because you, you can't have your vaccine. Well, at the, at the moment, it's applying to, to only, only to care workers, though the government is going to look at NHS I, work. And I, I think I, if I, people can't medically have it, there, there may be an exemption. I, I, know, I know, but it's been widely reported that it is going to move, it is going to, move to the NHS. Mm. I just think it's yeah, a fine. disgrace. You know, let's break this down into the simplest form. We're going to say to care workers, you know, and potentially NHS workers, unless you pump your body full of a chemical, because let's be honest, that's what it is. And I've had both my vaccine. I'm not vaccine hesitant, but I just think there's something seriously wrong where we tell people, unless they put their body full of a chemical, they, they, they are out of the job. I just think it's falling. Colette? Thank you, Fiona. Good evening, panel. Um, I think I re resonate a lot with what PS said there. Um, I mean, it really concerns me that 20% of our NHS and you know, care workers are from the BAME community. And I think the strategy should have been to win trust and actually work with those communities to actually get the vaccine rates up before we start forcing mandatory policy on them. Because, you know, we, we don't know, we've already got a massive shortage of staff in these areas. And then what's next? As an employee, does that mean I can do it in my, in my employment? Um, but I think, you know, like PS said, I think we've got to tread very carefully with this. We've, we, we've, we've got the potential to lose a lot of um, very good people. Dave. Thanks, Fiona. Yeah, ethically, it's a very, very difficult one to actually try and um, sort out. One of the things I'm personally feeling is that how and why do we need, feel the need to actually force people and almost twist the hands behind the back and say, if you don't get it, you haven't got a job. And that is ethically wrong. It, you know, where do we start? Where do we stop? Do we go to the police? service? Do we go to the fire service? Do we go to the ambulance service? You know, okay. I work with elderly people as well uh, within the outdoor sector. Um, well, I have, you know, yes, I've had the vaccine, I've had both. I'm very fortunate. But where do we actually stop with this? And that's what's the ethically wrong aspect of it. So, Sarah, what's the Labour position on this? So, obviously, this was um, announced today and there's going to be a consultation on, on, on going wider to the NHS. I think the starting point with this issue isn't whose rights are more important in this debate, but what will get the outcome that the most people as possible can get vaccinated? What will actually deliver the outcome, which is what we want, which is that everybody gets vaccinated, everybody is protected? And I think from that starting point, there is uh, there's something to be positive about, which is that this country is one of the most vaccinated countries in the world. We've actually we, we, we're incredibly um, successful in terms of persuading and, and, and educating and, and sure. But if your if vaccine. your mother was in a care home, uh, and by definition 
most of the elderly in care homes are, are vulnerable. Yeah. Would you be happy for her to be looked after well, by, by care workers who have not been vaccinated? If I could, if I could just finish the point, the, the, the challenge with um, forcing people to have the vaccine is, is twofold. One is there's 100,000 shortfall in care workers at the moment and we risk um, putting our vulnerable people in an even worse situation if they don't have the support that they need from, from carers if we do see people leaving um, uh, the system. And the other problem is that the people who are vaccine hesitant are, you know, have strong views that they feel very strongly and not going to necessarily be affected by the government telling them that they have to have a vaccine. So I'm not convinced, and the Labour Party is not convinced, that this will work. I think we need to look at places like Wales, where they've got a higher level of uh, vaccination amongst uh, workers, where it's about education, it's about making sure people can take time off work if they need to, that they're confident that they can take time off work if they're poorly after they've had the vaccine, and it's about informing and enabling people to, to get that outcome. But the outcome must be that everybody gets the vaccination. That's what we're aiming for. I'm not convinced this is the way to, to do it. I mean, if I could try and persuade Sean that although you might think it's wrong, uh, I, I don't agree that it's shameful. Uh, as you can see, I take a different view from you, but I, 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 the, the thing about this, people uh, are working in environments without being vaccinated, and that's also an ethical problem uh, for the vulnerable people. So there are, there are two ethical problems, and you're trying to balance them against each other. And so it, I think shameful is just to to think it's a simple question, but it isn't a simple question. And I, I take a different balance to you. Now, Ian, when it comes to the number of care workers being vaccinated, Sarah, you mentioned Wales, but, but, but Scotland's done particularly well on this. Yeah, we have. And I think issues of consent are really important. Issues of leadership are important. And as Colette said in your audience, trust. And I was just looking at the, the figures today from Scotland. We're actually at 100% of care workers have had the vaccine. So we don't face this issue. And I think, you know, and one why of the do things, you think that is? Well, I think... And one I'm of the not, things, clearly, I'm not asking you to blow your own, the government's trumpet here, but, but, but sensibly, why do you think Scotland has succeeded there? Where you've got... In London, for example, just 23% of care homes have reached the target which is, of four-fifths which is just, of staff just being appalling. vaccinated. But I think... So what's what you, So what you've got in Scotland, I think, is a government at large which is trusted. And one of the key factors over the course of the last 15 months has been the First Minister, almost on a daily basis, giving a press conference, giving information to the public as to what's going on and what was expected of people, giving guidance rather than actually putting things down in statute where appropriate and seeking to take people with us. And I think we've all talked about the success of the vaccine programme, and well, we should applaud that. But, you, you but at a more local level, presumably, things are being done differently. But the point, the point is that we've had a consistency of message. We've communicated fairly with the public, and the public in the main have come with us in that journey, a difficult journey for so many people. And I applaud our care workers, our frontline workers, for everything they've done. And the fact that so many in those communities, in the care community, have taken the vaccine so we don't face this problem. And I, I do think, when you, you look at everything that's happened over the last while, look at the fact that the unlocking's been put back a few weeks. You've got a government in London that continuously overpromises, that changes the messaging to the public and you end up in a situation that it hasn't been able to to win the war on this and to convince people the way it should have done that they need to be vaccinated and that's the difference sean do you want to come back in yeah yeah i ju just have just obviously wanted the right to apply to you know to the to the gentleman i want you know you know i don't need telling how you know important it is you know for vulnerable people i was one of those vulnerable people i'm disabled and i've had sepsis twice in the last year during the pandemic so, you know, please don't, please don't think I'm insulting, you know, vulnerable people. However, the point that I'm making to tell people that unless they have chemicals, and let's be honest, and I'm not anti-vax, but that's what it is in its simplest form, chemicals pumped into their bloodstream, or they're going to lose their jobs, some of them who can't have it through no fault of their own, you know, that, that is appalling. We've been told to cut these people. Now we're telling them that they're not going to have a job. And, you know, are you going to say that visitors to care homes and hospitals potentially have got to be vaccinated? You know? Well, just, just to be clear, the moment the government is talking about an exemption for people who can't have the vaccine for medical reasons, they're not talking about visitors. I mean, none of this is clear yet. It's yet to be debated. But other people who go in, like beauticians, other workers have to go in, yes, they would be expected to be vaccinated. I'm going to move on and take another question, because this is not the only 
uh, subject on, on COVID. Let's take a question from Nicola. Nicola Weiser. Um, should we be delaying Freedom Day for another four weeks? Well, Rosa, I'm going to come to you because I imagine you have fairly strong views about this um, in terms of the, 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 the world of entertainment and theatre in particular. Yes, and thank you for the question, Nicola. Yes, it's a huge issue for the live industries. Um, Pre-pandemic, uh, in a year, 34 million people go to live theatre more than go to see Premier football matches, Premiership football matches. So the last 16 months have been unimaginable for our industry. Uh, it is, at its very essence, it is live. It's about that experience of all being together and sharing an experience. And uh, the news earlier this week was devastating because it was uh, as contradictory to what we've been led to believe. And of course, theatres and productions can't just be rustled up overnight or in a week. It takes months to line up a major production, which can be employing more than 100 people on a single show. To line that up, to have it ready for a specific date is really, really tough and it needs time. And, I think uh, and given, that, Rosemary, given that, given that the infection rate has been rising here, do you have any sympathy, though, with the idea that it's best to delay for four weeks just to try and, 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 and stop a third, a, another wave? I think it's, it's contradictory what's happening at the moment. None of the pilots that were held in theatre, the Crucible Theatre, there were um, lots of pilots held. The data that I've seen and been told about does not show that transmission increases whether a theatre is 25%, 50% or 100% full. So we have got a few theatres opening at the moment. They can operate at 50%. But just to give you an example, it's trading in London at about 7% of what the trading was pre-pandemic. And in the regions where I am, for example, in Cornwall, there are no theatres open at the moment. It's down to 4 or 5% regionally. So this is people's businesses, their jobs, their livelihoods. If so many people, freelancers, don't, haven't, haven't been eligible for the furlough. It has been a nightmare 16 months. And the sooner we can get back, the better. There's no evidence to say that performing in a theatre where you all look forwards, you don't necessarily talk to anyone apart from the person in your bubble who's sitting next to you. We need to get on and get back. And what we need is certainty okay. around a date. So we have to stick to this July date. And if we can't stick to that July date, July date what we need is an industry and we are a huge industry. Okay. All right. Let, let me bring in the let me bring in the rest of the panel, Rosemary. Just forgive me, because otherwise yeah. we won't get time to bring anyone else. Uh, Sarah, Labour supports the idea of delaying for four weeks. Are you swayed though by what Rosemary says? Well, I'm enormously sympathetic. I mean, there's only but not swayed by it. Not swayed. I think that I think the, the the fact that we now have the highest infection rates in in Europe, which is a, a league table we didn't want to top again uh, anytime soon, means that we we have to. To, we have to lock down, unfortunately, but there's only one reason we're delaying uh, this roadmap, and it's the Delta variant. And there's only one reason that the Delta variant is as rampant it, it, as it is across the UK, and that's because this government was too slow to close the borders. It's absolutely clear that the, the one has caused the other. So what the government needs to do now is to put in place, alongside the public health measures, <clears throat> an economic support measure as well. So your case in point about theatres, but uh, you know, I was talking to a, a, a pub owner in, in my constituency yesterday who's just cancelled all the live music that she'd planned for July. All of those musicians devastated, they'll get no support. So we have to extend the support on furlough. We have to extend business rates relief. Yep. We have to sort out proper payment for isolation. And it was horrific, the, the news we had today that the government had tried to kind of hide uh, information information about how people could self-isolate and we have to um, look at how people are going to pay back some of these loans as well because people have a lot of debt that they're building up. The pubs that, and, and restaurants that don't have outside space can only have about a third capacity so they're running at a loss, they're building up debt as we go. But this government didn't lock down, didn't do what we told them to do from January, February at the start of this year. And so we have our wonderful vaccination programme. And on the other hand, we're throwing it all away by, by not securing our borders. It's absolutely bad policy from this government. And they need to make sure it's not, it's not, it's not people who are on, you know, really struggling at the end of, of their tethers that, that end up suffering. Now, Mark, obviously you, you led the Commons Rebellion yesterday against this uh, unlocking for another four weeks. When you were on the programme last in April, mm -hmm. you wanted to unlock their 
then, mm. in February, sorry, forgive me, you want to unlock then. No, 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 in February. You want right, to unlock in April. Set out a road exactly, and you are on in February. You want road. to unlock yeah. in April. I'm just wondering, given what's happened with the Delta variant, do you think we'd be in a far worse place now no, if I, we had I, unlocked I, I think tying unlocking to the vaccination programme is exactly right. So going directly to Nicola's question, um, should we have delayed uh, getting back to normal for uh, another four weeks? No, I don't think we should, because... We've now, we have now offered a vaccine, a second dose of a vaccine, to all of the top nine groups, the, the groups that accounted for 99% of deaths, over 80% of hospitalisations. But people, more people um, would die. Well, look, look the, the problem is, Sarah, this disease is going to be with us forever. Mm -hmm. the, chief medical, uh, the chief scientific advisor said that. And I'm afraid the honest answer, if we're being honest with people, is vaccines are not 100% perfect. If you want to wait for a 100% perfect vaccine, you'll be waiting forever. So the fact is, uh, at some point, we have to get back to normal. And I'm afraid the brutal truth is some people will get COVID, uh, e even if they've been vaccinated. And of those people, some people will become ill. And I'm afraid some people will tragically die. In but the obviously same way, far fewer if same... more people are vaccinated. Well, of course, I mean, that stands but, for reason. And in the same way, some people, uh, we get something like 15,000 people a year die of seasonal flu. And but we've you never were saying that in November, country. and so many so, people well, have died. Yeah, but the difference is, yeah, but the difference is we now have a fantastically successful vaccine. And the only piece of information that we learned this week didn't know when we were going to unlock on the 21st of June, is that the vaccines are fantastically successful, including against the Delta variant. Mm -hmm. And my worry is this, coming back to Rosemary's concerns, if you look at what the government set out yesterday and what we were voting on, the four-week delay is to collect data to make another decision and test. It's not a guaranteed end And to give people time to have two doses, well, isn't it? Yes, yes but the problem is 96% of people have already had two doses in those risk groups. Not the over 50s. Uh, yes, yes, 14% no, of the over 50s um, haven't had the second dose. A, a, a but they haven't offered had it. Some people haven't had it. The, the, the first doses, which is about transmission, if you read what the government said yesterday in the documents... Well, I did. I, I listened to your speech. Shadow Minister yeah, said it, yeah. uh, and, I, and I did as well. We're not actually going to vaccinate these younger people until August because yes. there's a supply issue. Yeah. So my worry is, on the 19th, or the week before the 19th of July, my worry is we're going to see the same scientists being wheeled out, you know, you know, the ones that are on the stage, but all speak in a personal capacity. There's going to be a, a drumbeat again, and once again, it's going to be put off. And then worse, in the winter, and there are government documents, internal documents, talking about the autumn and winter and the pressure on the NHS, is we're going to see the pressure again to, to introduce restrictions and do this all over again. And that'll be absolutely... It'll destroy businesses and confidence across the country. At some point, we have got to learn to live with this virus, uncomfortable though it is, and I think we should have started that process on the 21st of June. Ian, you've been harumphing all through that. Well, I, I have <laughs> to say, I, I find Mark's approach to this quite chilling. We've had 128,000 deaths in the United Kingdom. There's the phrase that the Prime Minister has allegedly made, let the bodies pile high. If Mark and his colleagues had got their way, then the death rate in this country no, will increase. No, it it is condemning Nonsense. people to death. Whereas no, all that we know, yeah. all that we know is that if we get people the vaccination, then the chance of reducing the hospitalisation and the death rate is greater. Nobody wants to see the arts community or any other sector of the economy put into a situation that they can't operate. Good we all want theatres to open as quickly as possible. We all want people to get back to, to work. But the fact of the matter is, and Sarah is right, the failure to close the borders, the failure to stop the Delta variant taking root, and by the way, the Scottish Government sought the powers to do that. We, we sought the powers to stop people coming in from India for people to be forced to quarantine. And Westminster wouldn't do it. They simply wouldn't give people in Scotland, the government, the powers to do that. It was the abdication right. of responsibility by the UK government. But one of the things which is really important in all of this, Fiona, is that we have got three million people in the United Kingdom that have been excluded from financial support for over a year. And a lot of them are working in the, the arts profession. Now, there are elements I would applaud of the furlough scheme up until now. It's worked well. It's kept people off the unemployment register. But I am absolutely disgraced and outraged that so many of our constituents have not had a penny of help from this government and people are really struggling and the government's got to accept responsibilities for those that are freelancers those working in the art sector and okay. the final point i will make is because very briefly because i want to come to the audience they won't get time to get a word in recovery I, I do have some concerns just as sarah has, has said that a lot of businesses are in deep financial difficulties 
with a debt pile that's increasing. Now, in Scotland, we don't have business rates for businesses in the hospitality sector. We've, we've kept them off for the, the rest of this financial Briefly, year. Briefly, Ian, but I've got to, to let other people in. This can't just be the Ian Blackford show. Are fall over because they're going to be cash flow constrained as the recovery builds. And the government's okay. got to accept right, it. Right. All right. Let me come to the audience. Ian, we really want to hear what you say, but if, if you speak at that length, no one else is going to get a word in. Uh, Nicola. Um, it seems to me that we have, you know, we really want the government to follow the science all along and, and it seems to me that, you know, they are doing that this time. And although it is frustrating and we do all want to be back to normal, I do think, you know, another four weeks of the wonderful vaccination programme does mean that a lot more people are protected and, it, and it's a very early disease. We don't still know the effects of long COVID and if we could prevent that for, you know, a, a few more thousand people, then I think that's, that, that is useful. Carlos? This ideology really coming from the Conservative Party, in particular the backbenchers that rebel, is torturous, you know, at a time when what we need are to be taught the discipline to be in it together. You know, we all more or less have common sense and realise that we're going to have to sacrifice another four weeks. But it's this constant interference with the discipline required to do that. Uh, from the COVID recovery team. That's just painful. Charlie, I can see you shaking your head at that. Yeah, it's, it's basically just people saying that, do we have freedom or should we be told what to do? Um, and the panel tonight, you know, everybody seems to be saying something sensible and something stupid. Um, <laughs> you know, Ian Blackford, you know, he should take over the Labour Party as Captain Hindsight you know, going on the past, and yet on the second hand, exactly agree with him and Sarah about this desperate need for support for the businesses that have been de delayed a month. Um, and every single person, and it's coming across with the panel, with, uh, with us as well, is on one hand saying something and then basically contradicting themselves on the next sentence. We don't know, we really don't know. Uh, I run an outdoor events business, it's, yeah, horrible. Absolutely horrible at the moment. However, I understand that it's going to be horrible, and I understand that we have to make sacrifices. And at the moment, the way the Delta variant's going, yeah, it's 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 not great. We need to be careful. Daniel, well, I heard Mark say talk about scientists being wheeled out, and I thought to myself, that isn't actually a bad person to wheel out. Yeah. It's better that than they wheel out me. Um, I, 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 well, we're wheeling at you, Daniel. So let's I, hear your view. I, I, because, and you're wheeling out somebody who doesn't know when you're wheeling out me, and in fact, all of us don't know. Uh, and actually, the scientists themselves are making estimates, but at least they're doing and, it on and the basis... And some of them also well, disagree. Yeah, and at least they're doing it on the basis of, um, of proper modelling uh, and a, a lot of medical knowledge. And Let me come back on that. If, uh, you know, with respect, Mark, in November, uh, you urged a course which would have been disastrous and on a reasonable basis, which was that we didn't know for certain that things were going to be as bad as... The scientists said, but I always said, well, we don't know that for certain. It could be worse. And indeed it was. Uh, and all that we can do in this situation is try our best to use the best knowledge that we have from the most knowledgeable people and make some sort of estimate about it, rather than as complete amateurs with no modelling, sticking our oar in to say what we think should happen without any idea whether that's a, actually a good idea at the expense of people potentially dying. So I, I rather agree with you. Um, I think that... Um, it has been a bit of a dispiriting sight and people I respect a lot have, in my view, said things that I can't really respect. Well, well look, let me just come back. On, on November, Dan, all I said in November was I wanted the government to actually set out a proper set of evidence. You you're, voted you're against remember, the lockdown. You'll remember the leaked slide about NHS capacity, which was uh, leaked out mm. the day before the Prime Minister made the decision, never published, never stood up. And all I ever said was, if the government's going to make really big, difficult decisions, all Parliament deserves is all the data, the honest facts, to be able to make a decision. And in January, when that information was available, I actually didn't oppose the, the current lockdown because I look at the facts and I change my mind accordingly. On, on this, you know, the debate, I, I'm, I'm actually not prepared to accept people who disagree with you then being accused of you wanting to kill lots of people. This is a balanced judgment. Coming back to what Danny said, the thing we have to do as members of Parliament and ministers, and it is difficult, is look at the scientific advice 
but you also have to look at the consequences, the economic impact, and you have to balance all of those things. Yes. And just let me pick the final point, Fiona, on the modelling. Interestingly, this week, we discover, after the government made the decision, decision to push this out by four weeks, I think largely based on modelling, funnily enough, a new set of models are, are produced at SAGE with the new vaccine efficacy yes. data, which amazingly have much lower... Um, uh, proposals for, for how many people might die, and a different decision may have been made. Now, some of us correct. did take the trouble to look at the models in great detail, yeah. notice the assumptions were not correct, but and that's partly they were very why sensitive we reached to the, the decisions. That's correct. Yes. So, but that's so what modelling is, though. But so and some of us looked at the assumptions, you know, and actually, just because I'm not an epidemiologist doesn't mean I don't know how to look at a model, and I took the trouble to do that. But many and people, tried to many, make people good many people, when the facts change, they change their opinions, and the fact is that the virus is now spreading at a faster rate, it's doubling in less than a week, and as a consequence of that, hospitalisations will increase, deaths will increase. That is not the landscape. It's, it's, it's actually, actually slowing down. It's actually slowing well, down now. Sorry. Let me bring... If we're guys, to let do me, that, let your recipe is we'll never, we'll never Mark, exit. That's, that's let me bring back Rose. Rose, you wanted to come back into the conversation. Yeah, I think the vaccines clearly work. The numbers, of, the increases of hospitalisations and, and deaths is rising very, very slightly. What I'm, I'm want, I want to say for my industry is we need to go back to work. It is terrible. There are genuinely people, this is a world-leading business. We are best in class in the world. Look at Netflix. Look at all the Sky Channels. Look at all of the television stations. They come from British stage schools, British training, British theatre. We are great at it. Please let us get back to work. And the government must support us and our industry. And just in terms of, of facts and figures, I mean, there's so many different facts and figures we can bandy <coughs> band around. Hospital admissions have risen by 43% mm -hmm. in the last week. The numbers are still yeah. much smaller than they were, but they, they, have, they have risen. And they're doubling every seven to 12 days. Andy. Hi, Fiona, thanks. Um, yeah, I think what we need to understand here is that even our experts are still learning. Chief scientific officers, chief medical officers, this is a new disease. We are still learning um, because one model was done um, doesn't necessarily mean that's the only model that's ever going to be right. Things will change, people will learn more, models will change, scientific opinion will change. And I'm absolutely stunned that Mark said he could tell whether or not a model was correct, because I imagine that most scientists in the country, forget chief medical officers, would tell you that models are potentially out of date the minute they're created, because there'll be more factors. So let's not get political about this. Let's not start throwing stones at each other. Let's understand that this is new. This is constantly changing. You know, vaccines, we've all got used to the fact that we're learning about the vaccine. We seem to think that just because we're fed up with COVID, it's got to go away now. That's not, not the case. We don't have to sacrifice grandma. We also don't have to lock grandma in the cellar and never let her see the light of day again. Okay. What we do have to do is support people who can't work, make sure that companies who took money to support a furlough scheme used that money, and if they then did some whatever, went bankrupt or whatever, that that money was then given back to the government. Some of the large corporations, my understanding yeah. is, has some very interesting ways of dealing with government funding. We need to get our grip of it. OK. It's not... It's just not going to go away. Just because we're bored, it's, you know, you can't just say, right, that's it. Andy, thank you very much. Let's take another question from Andrea. Andrea McSherry. Thanks, Fiona. Can we trust the Metropolitan Police after an independent panel found them guilty of institutional corruption following the unresolved murder of Daniel Morgan? So, Andrew, let me just remind everyone, for those who are not totally up to speed with the details, uh, Daniel Morgan was a private detective. He was found murdered in a car park in a pub in South London in 1987. There have been five police inquiries, a collapse trial and an inquest into the killing, and no one's ever been convicted. And then there has been this government commission report that you say, um, which has talked about institutional corruption within the Metropolitan Police. Sarah. Um, Daniel Morgan's son lives in my constituency, so I've been um, talking to him about the inquiry, as you would imagine. And 34 years on 
from um, the murder of his father, we, we, we finally have some light shone on what's happened. And the report is, to be clear, incredibly damning. It really is. Um, both of the, the, the Home Office uh, and the Met Police and the whole structure around with, uh, you know, the, the way that all these inquiries operated. And it talks of a form of institutional corruption. Um, I was disappointed this week with the Home Secretary's response. Uh, we were all in, in, in Parliament asking her questions. I asked if she would come back before the summer recess to let us know what she will do about this because she didn't accept any of the findings at this point. She hasn't given any commitments to put into place any of the recommendations. And the question um, is, can we trust the Metropolitan yeah, Police? So the, 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 can when we? it comes to the Met, I think I talk to police officers every day. I'm the Shadow Policing Minister. I would um, absolutely support the police and, and trust the police. They've worked incredibly hard over the last year in particular with COVID, they've had a very hard time and they haven't had much thanks for it. But there so when, clearly so when the commission, the Cressida Dick, who was also criticising the report, says, mm -hmm. I do not accept that we are institutionally corrupt, she doesn't accept the criticisms of her, what do you make of that? Well, she said she's going to come back with a proper response and I think... But that's her, her response now. For her, she needs to show the leadership that says... We understand that we, you know, serious mistakes happened here, very serious mistakes, and we need to put it right. And my concern looking forward, you know, this, this has spanned 30 years, so it's not just Cresta that's been in charge for that whole period. But my concern is the Met is a very young workforce. We've got a lot of very new officers because um, a lot of people uh, lost their positions and, and we're re-recruiting. We have to make sure they have the training, have the uh, resilience, have the support that they don't get involved in anything like this. I mean, the, the, the story the inquiry is like something out of line of duty. It's absolutely horrific, and we have to make sure that doesn't happen again. So is everything OK? No, it absolutely isn't. Um, is the answer to sort of say, you know, let, sack this person or whatever? No, I don't think it is. I think we need a proper response. So, but it does need to be quite um, far-ranging, and they do okay. need to accept, the, you know, what the findings are. So the report, Daniel, has talked about institutional corruption, and, and it's not the first time the word institutional has been used. Mm -hmm in reference to the Met. I'm thinking of institution, institutionalised racism in the McPherson report all those years ago in the murder of Stephen Lawrence. And, and that was rejected and I think time has proven that it was correct. So this is a bit of a, a in, in some ways it's all political crisis for me. I can't really answer yes to your question completely. I can't answer it 100%. Uh, so you can't say yes, yes, I trust the I can't police. say yes to this question, which as somebody with my politics is very, very difficult. Uh, but the nature of this report coming on top of a whole load of other incidents just makes that impossible. And I'm afraid I thought the police response to this report was horrific. Uh, if you're being accused on really quite a solid basis of um, institutional corruption, which was not just withholding help from these inquiries and resisting the inquiry, but also underneath it, some quite serious allegations about the conduct itself, which is what was under behind it, um, you know, criminal acts, uh, and to then respond, well, we're not institutionally uh, corrupt as a, as a sort of flat answer, I just thought that was completely unacceptable as an institution. Mm -hmm. And I, I hate to be in a position because we all rely on the police force uh, in, in our daily lives for maintenance of law, the rule of law, and nothing's more important to me than the rule of law. So not to be able to say yes is a total political tragedy for me, but I can't. OK. Jo, what about you? Um, I think that with these sorts of things, there's a lot of mistrust uh, in the police. Uh, the Freshwater Five, for example, um, can't go to retrial. And I think these things need to be addressed properly. And when we have a Home Secretary that actually won't address the issues front and centre, or indeed answer questions that are put to her in the House, it's a very sad day. And I think that just demonstrates the lack of respect for the trust the British public should have in police forces, not just the Metropolitan Police. And actually, has anybody considered the thoughts and feelings of this man's family? Has anybody actually thought about that? Five investigations, five investigations that have been failed. It's disgraceful. Well, the family has, disgraceful. The family has said, Joe, at almost every step we found ourselves lied to, fobbed off, bullied, degraded and let down time and time again. Jack. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think there are, it's worth noting, you know, obviously there are countless uh, communities and groups that aren't just losing faith in the police or in other institutions because of this right now, but over 
years and years have. But I think that, you know, Daniel touched on something really important here, that there seems to be almost a, a pattern in uh, behaviour in our larger institutions of avoiding, feeling insulted perhaps, uh, being called institutionally something, rather than actually taking the responsibility to get better. I'd love an inquiry that led to a learning exercise rather than just yet another PR damage control exercise. Sherry? Isn't, isn't it mad to assume that the Metropolitan Police in general are corrupt? Surely it's certain parts of the police department that are corrupt, just as someone said in line of duty. You've got people in there who are corrupt. It's very hard to prove they're corrupt, but they're there. It's not the police in general. It's just a few bad apples within it. I mean, Ian, I just wanted to come to you. I mean, this report is about the Met, and it makes it clear mm. that it is only talking about the Met. I mean, just you know, you're talking to you, obviously, in terms of the SNP in Scotland, a review into Police Scotland not so long ago in December found very worrying evidence of mistreatment of black and minority ethnic officers. So, I mean, the Met has got this specific mm. problem as identi identified in this report. And obviously, there are problems in Police Scotland, too, of a different nature. Well, of course, I mean, we need to take responsibility, and the police need to take responsibility for what has happened here, whether there's been any other wrongdoing. And you have to feel for the family. 34 years of being lied to mm. before you get to the truth. This is not acceptable. And, and Cressida Dick, as the commissioner, has got to accept responsibility as the presiding officer of the, the police service in, in, in London for that. And, I, you know, I, I grieve, Fiona, that if we end up in a situation, whether it's in London, whether it's in Scotland or elsewhere, that people don't have trust in our police force. Because, as the, the gentleman has just said, the vast majority, the vast, vast majority of our police force are decent people trying to conduct a, a public service. And I want to applaud them for what they do day in, day out. But we can't walk away from this. So when you, have, when you have a report, for example, which says, in terms of Police Scotland, attitudes haven't changed as much as they should have since 1999, following the McPherson report. I mean, what can you do as the Scottish Government? Well, I think what can you do to change as, that? As politicians, we all have a responsibility. So, of course, this needs to be addressed in the, in the Scottish Parliament when it relates to Scotland. And as far as Westminster is concerned, we've got the, the Home Affairs Select Committee. They've got an important role to play in this. We need to make sure, as politicians, that we're doing everything that we can to ensure that the public can feel safe, that they can trust the police force. But it's not just over these issues. We've also had the, the long-running saga over Hillsborough and the lack of ability to deliver justice as well. Mm. And it holds us back, it holds us all back. And we have got to make sure that collectively that we work with the police force, wherever it is, to deal with these situations and rebuild that public trust and confidence. It's too important that we do that. And we've got to do that on a consensual basis. Well, Andrew's question is, can we trust the Metropolitan Police, Mark? Well, I think I'm, I'm sort of slightly, I'm not quite as far, I think, across as, as Danny is with that, because I think one, one thing you do as a member of parliament, which perhaps most members of the public don't get the chance to, is you do engage a lot with the police in a, in a if I like, a normal way, where you're not either having suffered some traumatic event or, or you've been caught by them or whatever, you know, you, you engage with them a lot. But it's very interesting and that your answer to that question is not yes. Well, the problem you're is... You're The problem is, if you look at that report, it clearly highlights a lot of problems. So my, my, what I was coming to was I was saying most police officers that I have ever met um, are trying to do the right thing, they're trying to protect people mm -hmm. and they're trying to support the community and I'm sure the vast majority of officers in the Met are trying to do that. Mm -hmm. But you can't ignore a report which highlights some really serious problems. And I, was, I, I remember this very clearly. I was a Home Office Minister and I was sat next to Theresa May uh, on the front bench when she set up this independent inquiry with some very reputable people uh, on the panel. It's a very serious job of work they've done. And I think the bit that I'm a, a bit disappointed about, I think, as Danny is, is if you head up the institution and you get a report like this, which is damning, you, you, you don't have to necessarily in the end accept all of it, but you really ought to have taken the trouble to really ask yourself some tough questions because there are clearly some issues. And just saying, yeah, it's all fine, which would be the implication of saying, if, if, if I said, yes, uh, there's no issue, I completely trust everybody in the Met, there's nothing wrong with the institution at all, that would be running completely counter to that report. Well, what they're saying is, is, is it that they, they have evolved since then. And, and well, the, the... But, but we've had a number of issues with this. You know, we had, and I just, I just think that the institution and, and the, the commissioner need to take this away, have a proper look at it, and come back with, a, I think, a more thoughtful response. There may be areas where they disagree with it, and if they do, they should set those 
reasons out properly, yeah. but they should grab some of the recommendations and show that they're taking it seriously. And ultimately, what you, what you want to get to is that, that Daniel's family and others in a similar position look at that and say, there's someone running this organisation, yes, mistakes will be made, but they're serious about getting it on a track to, to get it to be better. Rosemary. Um, well, I have to say, I think Daniel's family, 34 years, the resilience of going through all those multiple inquiries, I have to say, uh, respect to the family and what a terrible thing to have happened. Um, uh, I have uh, a great deal of uh, faith in Cressida Dick that she will take this very seriously. I had a lot of dealings with her. I took over as uh, president of our trade association in London on 7-7, on the day of 7-7. So in the immediate aftermath, that night was the first night that London Theatre closed down uh, before the pandemic since World War II. We did close that night and I had quite a lot of um, dealings with Cressida then and subsequently. Um, it is like an episode of Line of Duty. All these shadowy dealings in smoke-filled cars, in pubs, it's extraordinary reading. Um, what we're missing is Vicky McClure, the wonderful Vicky McClure. Uh, it was all men sitting in the car park, so it just strikes me as ironic that it's now landed at Cressida, who is a remarkable woman to have made the top job in the Metropolitan Police, her achievements. Uh, if that organisation is uh, institutionally corrupt, potentially institutionally racist, racist I'm certain that it, you could also deem that it was, at least at that time, institutionally sexist and during the time that Cressida came, rose to the top. She is, I know she will be taking this very seriously and, and, and will come back properly with a full response. We're going to take another question from Sue. Sue Lewis. Thank you. Does the Australian trade deal set a terrible precedent and threaten the long-term viability of British farming? Ian, you've been talking about this in the House of Commons. Yeah, absolutely, and I'm, I have to say I'm deeply worried about what this means for, for farming and indeed for, for crofters as well. Um, and of course, we shouldn't just be thinking about the Australian deal because this is the first trade deal that the UK has done of this kind <coughs> and could open the door for similar deals with Argentina, with Brazil, with the US and uh, with Canada as well. I mean, presumably you welcome the, the, the drop of the tariff on, Scotch whisk, on Scottish whiskey. On Scottish. Yeah, but the point, the, po the point is that have we created a set of circumstances where our farming industry is going to be imperiled? Because really what we've done is, as I said yesterday in the House of Commons, we've sold the farm, literally sold the farm. You've got a situation where the Australians are talking about the potential to sell $1.3 billion of products to the UK. And we're talking about, by the government's own analysis, an impact on our GDP of, wait for it, 0.02%. We would need 200 Australian trade deals to replicate what we've lost with Brexit. But when nonetheless, you've got a situation you... where the 5% tariff on scotch has been scrapped as part of the deal, and whiskey's worth around or some £4 billion pounds to the Scottish economy, whereas beef farming, I'm not saying it's not important, but it's worth about a billion. Well, so you must no, welcome that aspect hang on, hang on. of the deal. You've got about 67,000 people that are connected with Scottish agriculture in one way, form or another. And we've just created a situation that, as of the beginnings of this deal, 25,000 tonnes of lamb can come into the, the UK. That's three times as much as currently comes in. Within 10 years, you'd be talking about 75,000 tonnes, 10 times. And you're really talking about, when you're talking about hill sheep farmers, whether it's in Scotland, Wales or parts of Northern England, you're talking about, in many cases, subsistence farming. And you're talking about people that are going to be forced out of business. Now, one of the real ironies of this is the government's negotiated a deal where people can go and work in Australia. They're going to be sending people from the UK to Australia to work in farms in Australia to put our farmers out of business. That's what this government has done. Mm -hmm. It is madness on stilts. Mark, and, you know, we've had a situation that Brexit was about okay. taking back control. We've just sold out our fishermen and we're just about to sell so out the, our farmers. Of course, the thing about this deal, Mark, is we still don't know the detail. There's some, we're finding out details from, from Canberra but not finding out details here. Why is that happening? Well, my understanding is the government set out the outline of it and obviously it's been worked up now into a legal text which we'll have to debate and vote on in Parliament. But look, I think this is a good deal. Uh, I think it's also, by the way, worth saying um, that, the, that we've just done a deal with the US as well to, to deal with tariffs on Scotch whisky, which is fantastic news for Scotland, double win for Scotland. But this is about opening up opportunities for British businesses and British farmers to be able to sell into markets uh, overseas as well. Trade is a two-way thing. Good deals 
for trade deals are about a win-win for both sides. And this will be a precedent, I hope, to get us into that Trans-Pacific deal, which will open up big opportunities for British farmers. The price of a lot of these food products You're in Asia... You're talking about industrial are, farming are, are, with, are with higher worse in, animal welfare higher standards. Higher in Asia... Um, and actually, that's why we're not going to see huge amounts of product actually coming in from Australia, because actually to get a much better price for in Asia, big opportunities for our farmers. And actually, Australia is a country, you know, we share a head of state, uh, they're our mates, um, you know, we have very close security relationship with them. Very far do, geographically, obviously. But if you can't do a trade deal with Australia, if you really are saying you can't do a trade deal with Australia, you're basically saying you can't do a trade deal with anyone. And, of course, Ian, as is well, so I'll, inevitable I'll, I'll, from the I'll tell the Crofter and the farmer to sell up that we should have had the state. That'll get comfort to them. It, you know, within about two seconds, which is rather typical of the SNP. Rosemary. Um, well, uh, I'm not an expert on this, but I do sit on the UK Trade and Business Commission, which is a cross-party <coughs> initiative to bring together business leaders and experts to discuss the impact of Brexit. And agriculture and uh, importing in these treaties are something very much at the top of the agenda. Just as a layperson, it seems ca completely counterintuitive with a government that has a green agenda that we're going to be trying to ship food from the other side of the world. I think we were all aware about the Suez Canal, that the, you could see from the atmosphere the pollution from all of the, uh, of, of the boats that were held up, the massive ships, the container ships that were held up um, by the Suez Canal. So we're going to be using huge amounts of energy to transport the food. Well, we've got lots of food that we could, we could be importing that's 100 miles away. So I find that completely counterintuitive. I also think that there are... I love Australia. I'm delighted about the three years for young people to go and work there. We're just about to open a theatre in Sydney, so I've spent a lot of time over there. But, you know, farming and agriculture is massive. It's on a massive scale in Australia. I think the largest farm there is something like the size of the state of Israel. So it's going to be a tiny, tiny um, proportion of food that's going to be coming uh, for, for Australia, and yet for us, I, I think we could find a better solution closer to home. It seems very strange. Sarah? Um, yeah, well, I, I mean, we haven't obviously seen the detail yet. Um, on issues like this, I look to organisations like the uh, NFU, National Farmers Union. They are very concerned in a very similar way um, that Ian and, and, and Rosemary have outlined. Um, uh, very concerned about animal welfare standards the NFU have talked about. I can remember being on uh, Question Time a couple of years ago talking about why we can't put some of this stuff into legislation in this country to, to, to make sure exactly this situation doesn't occur. Um, and I know that farmers are, are very concerned that we'll see uh, products coming into this country and, and, and undermining our farmers. I think it's it's very um, uh, separating it from from the economy. It's very interesting to, to look at how we as a country take on this kind of new role in global Britain. Now we are outside of the EU and how we use our soft power, our skills, our negotiating skills, uh, our capacity to uh, to trade with other countries. And, and but the and question is, it does this set a terrible precedent? And threaten the long-term viability of British farming. Yes, or well, no? I think I think it's a, it's a poor deal. It's very small amount of uh, GDP. It's 0.02 percent. I mean, so so in the grand scheme of things, it's it's not it's not um, uh, groundbreaking. But for those farmers who actually are going to be undercut, which is exactly what the government said was never going to happen, now does seem to be happening. So it is it is a concern. Well, yeah. I feel a bit naive. I'm certainly not an expert on on farming, and I, 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 I but I do buy product uh, and you have to look at it from both ends not just the production but also the people who buy it and the reason the only reason why it could possibly be a threat to farming in this country is if consumers choose to buy this product rather than the ones that are being produced here because Which they it's, may if it's because cheaper, it's cheaper. Uh, and so therefore the whole point of trade is somebody swaps something for something else you can't lose in a trade that's the whole point of trading uh, I am therefore my starting position is I like deals which reduce tariffs. It's ridiculous to suggest that this is going to make any difference compared to leaving the single market of the European Union. Uh, you can look at the figures and it obviously won't, and it won't even achieve even the tiny uh, increase in uh, production that the government is talking about. Probably be, you know, it's going to be close to zero, the impact on GDP. But I can't be against it because reducing the costs of goods so that we produce the things that we're best at producing and other people produce the things that they're best at producing and the consumer gets a good deal on both has got to be 
the right but Daniel, thing. the, human, the if... human impact of that is massive because the NFU yes. and NFU Scotland go to great lengths every year to go around the supermarkets to get them to take our product in preference to, to lamb yeah, from, from elsewhere. And, and there is this issue of cost. It's massively important. So if, if I look at crofters in Skye or elsewhere in the Highlands, as an example, there's no alternative to sheep farming. So no. if we cannot make money from selling sheep, then that livelihood, that way of life that's existed for generations, comes to an end. And you ask yourself, for what? For the ability to increase our GDP by 0.02%. But, but why don't you think that our farmers livelihood. are going to be able to export things? There's an opportunity here for us to it's, sell well, as well. You, know, really, you just, just look at the negative side of it. The, well, no, I'm not, because I'm talking deal. about an industry which is going to be imperiled right. by the gross stupidity and the willful neglect mm. that your but, government is showing. Do, and it's do, that do, don't care attitude as to what happens to people that have been engaged well, in but activities. But aren't the you're suggesting sheep farmers produce fantastic. Why wouldn't people still want to buy them? I listen to you very, 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 very carefully, and I'll obviously have to reflect on what you say because it's yeah. important. You've got experience in that area, but it, you are suggesting that we 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 protect these industries by making everybody pay more for their food, and then it, probably on another question time, you'll come back and say we've got too much food poverty in this country, which we well, do the fact, have. The fact is and we and have... you you know the way that we can drive you know drive improvements in living standards is by constant increases in trading. But, so so I do understand what you're saying. I think any economic change is difficult, and the costs of this are concentrated. The benefits are thinly spread. It's a quality so product. So people like me do have to think yeah, about. But what it's you going to be say, a quality product still. that's going to be okay. undercut, Daniel, and that's the point. And I... of course, with the, with the animal welfare standards that are vastly different. That's what should give us concern. OK. Uh, we've got very little time, but a lot of people ask this next question, <coughs> so we're going to hear it from Colette. Thank you, Fiona. Good evening, panel. Um, is Matt Hancock hopeless? Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, so. Well, um, gosh, uh, reading these exchanges were quite extraordinary, weren't they? And I think they probably say more about the Prime Minister than they do about Matt Hancock, um, that, that he believes his Health Secretary to be incompetent and yet um, uh, leaves him in charge of, of uh, our response to a global pandemic. That in itself is shocking. I mean, I think the messages speak to um, the chaos in number 10, the chaos in government, uh, the lack of ability to get a grip, the, the, the fact that okay. we were too slow. Oh, sorry, you've got to be really brief. We've, got, like, the question, we've literally got one and a half say, minutes left. If I was to pick who I was going to sack, would it be Priti Patel because she broke the parliamentary, the um, okay. serial code? Would it be Matt for breaking the law? Would it be Michael Gove for breaking the law? You could, you could take the Mark. Pick. Right. Do you, do you, do you agree answer. with the Prime Minister's verdict that Matt Hancock is, t is totally hopeless? No, hurtless? and I think any of us who've been in business know that when things are very stressful, you sometimes say things that you don't really mean. I mean, you said it twice. And, and on the general point and all the evidence from Dominic Cummings, last year when he went to Barnard Castle, I was very clear. I publicly said to the Prime Minister he should resign, mm -hmm. uh, Dominic Cummings, that is. And if Dominic Cummings didn't resign, the Prime Minister should sack him. And I think probably if the Prime Minister reflects on that advice, he probably okay. wishes he'd taken it and had sacked Dominic Cummings last year, and then we wouldn't be here. Daniel, for is all... Matt Hancock hopeless? Not in my experience. And for all of Dominic Cummings, his great intelligence and ability, I think we're much better off without him in the government. Uh, I think that uh, it did create chaos. He pointed to a lot of mistakes the government made. We have to learn from those. But he's pursued a personal vendetta against Matt Hancock, which is very undignified and unjustified, in my opinion. Ruth, you're going to have to be very brief. Is Matt Hancock hopeless? That's Colette's question. Um, I think he kind of begs the question uh, about how the pandemic was, was actually handled in those early days. And it sort of led to the issues that we're facing now, that, you know, it's neither one thing or another. I don't know if he's hopeless or not, I wasn't there, but it sounds completely chaotic with people flip-flopping. You've got about 10 seconds, Ian. Well, if the Prime Minister doesn't have confidence in Matt Hancock, why should the rest of us have to... Be Cummings should never have been there. He should never have been in government. But what he has done is shone a light on what has gone on. And you've got a government that has been dysfunctional over the handling of this COVID crisis. Audience, I'd have loved to come to URQT50, but I'm out of time, so forgive me. Colette, thank you for putting the question. A, a number of you did, as I say. Our hour is up. Thank you very much to the panel for coming here this evening. Rosemary, thank you for joining us from Cornwall. We're all very jealous that you're down there. It looks lovely. And the sunshine. The sunshine. Lucky you. To our QT50, thank you so much for joining us. And, of course, to you at home, thank you so much for watching from Question Time. Bye-bye. Well, next, more about Dominic Cummings and also the inquiry into the Manchester Arena attack. It's newscast in just a moment.